So now um, say goodbye to these guys. I'd like to call up uh, Don McQuiston. Don, if you could make a magical appearance on the screen here. Thank you. So um, transitioning into our, our next panel. So this is gonna be where we try to bring science into looking at this, into the, this problem of the secondary trauma. You know, there's a lot of discussion about, we wanna have evidence-based modalities, evidence-based treatments, evidence-based laws. Well, that's what this, that's what this panel is about. And uh, Dawn has been a leader in that. Uh, she's a professor now at Wofford College. Before that, she was at uh, Arizona State. I have her speak to my um, Innocence and Justice Clinic and sometimes my criminal procedure class about eyewitness identification. And uh, lately, um, you know, we've been talking about these issues with, with judges and jurors. And uh, she's been helping us also with another study that we're going to be talking about today. But so Dawn's a psychologist. Uh, don't ask her for a prescription because she's a research psychologist but she's gonna be uh, heading up this panel now. And um, the, the other speakers, uh, I'll be talking with uh, Stephanie Seaton and Kimberly Wiseman in a little bit. And then we're gonna have a, another professor, uh, Lindsay Harris, uh, as, we, as we move into this next hour of discussion about study. So uh, Dawn, I will turn this over to you. Can you hear me? Great. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to say before I get started on my presentation. We have three presentations today, and I'll be I'll be going first. I wanted to say how much I appreciated the tribute to Larry Hammond. I have such fond memories of him. He uh, I met him when I was a, a first or second year being a professor out of graduate school at Arizona State University, and he I do some consulting, and he hired me on my first case um, when I was just getting my feet wet. Um, and I just have such great memories. He came to um, speak to my class. I teach psychology and law and he guest lectured a few times in my in my classes um, and students really loved him. So I wanted to, um, to say that before I got started. Uh, one more thing related to the research that I'm presenting today is how much I enjoyed Robbie Greer's presentation. Um, and I don't know if Robbie is still watching, but what he had to say really echoes my echoes the, the research that I'm interested in doing that I've been, that I've been conducting over the last few years. Um, he he mentioned that for 20 years he couldn't talk about the case that he was on, that it took many years for him to decide that it was time for him to seek counseling. And so um, that really speaks to one of my main interests here, which is in uh, jurors processing of information in the, in the courtroom. So I'm gonna share some slides with you. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today and I'm gonna give about a um, 12 minute presentation or so. And I'm gonna share the results of a couple of studies that I've conducted on uh, jurors and judges along with uh, my students at Wofford College, a couple of different groups of students that have been integral to carrying out this research. So let's start here with what is vicarious trauma and what is secondary traumatic stress. And so vicarious trauma experienced psychological trauma from secondhand exposure to traumatic situations. And so there are people in all kinds of careers that experience this kind of trauma, people in the medical field, people in the legal field, social workers, um, doctors, lawyers, etc. Of course, we're focusing on um, the legal field today. And one of the negative consequences of experiencing vicarious trauma is secondary traumatic stress. And so those symptoms are similar to post-traumatic stress, unwanted flashbacks, avoidance, nightmares, um, the potential for um, substance abuse problems, depression, anxiety, all of those things that degrade normal functioning. And so the research that I do, um, which is really in its infancy, is focused on um, how the stress of serving on a jury, as well as 
um, how, how judges are susceptible, both of those groups, how they're susceptible to secondary traumatic stress. And so let's begin with jurors. So um, I love this line, can jury duty actually be hazardous to your health? Of course, if you do a quick Google search on um, jurors and trauma, jurors and uh, crying, jurors and stress, um, you're gonna find a ton of articles like this. And I just grabbed some headlines that I came across. Um, the trauma of jury duty, the hidden horrors of jury duty. Um, why jurors are often left without counseling. So there's a lot of, lot of articles online about this. And so these are obviously sensationalized headlines, um, but the takeaway seems to be that some of the, some jurors, um, their experiences can be traumatizing. Now, these are all interesting pieces, but they appear to be full of anecdotal evidence. And so what I was interested in doing um, was looking into the literature to see what has been done scientifically on this topic. And it turns out that there has been quite a lot of research done that dates back to the mid 1980s. And so research looking at jurors and stress um, started out with what they call these free-flowing interviews. So the initial studies looked at a group of capital jurors, asked them about their experiences, and then some jurors from particularly traumatic cases. And so what it turned out was that, yes, indeed, uh, many ex-jurors experienced symptoms that were consistent with post-traumatic stress and depression, things like nightmares, intrusive thoughts, memories, insomnia, avoidance, et cetera. And so these initial studies sparked a real interest in then going forward and doing um, very structured interviews um, and using uh, more validated scales, psychological measurements. Um, and so here's just a sampling of, the, of some of the results of those studies. Couple of in a couple of these studies, about a third of participants reported um, symptoms that were consistent with post-traumatic stress. Um, another study found that traumatic cases resulted in more post-traumatic stress and depression symptoms than non-traumatic cases. And then the Capital Jury Project, which has been going on for, for years interviewing ex jurors serving on capital cases found that more than half were emotionally upset and a third had insomnia, loss of appetite. So again, um, these findings are really consistent with each other. We're, we're finding that many ex jurors are reporting long-term side effects. And so not just right after the trial, during the trial, really long-term um, side effects that are consistent with post-traumatic stress. And so overall, what are the specific factors that are associated with um, jurors' symptoms? And so I've listed what seemed to be at the top of the list here and gruesome evidence, graphic evidence, emotionally disturbing testimony. Those seem to be the things that extras list most often as contributing to their, to their symptoms. Some other interesting findings, of course, the traumatic stress can worsen in the following weeks and months after trial. I think that's an, uh, an important aspect of this to consider. And interestingly, that women tend to demonstrate more severe symptoms than men. So next, um, what is it that is being done to reduce stress stress? And so what I found were three different things that the courts um, are often um, offering to, to jurors. The first is pretrial conversations with jurors. And so this is um, simply just having conversations, the judge having conversations with jurors before the trial starts, letting them know what um, they might see and how um, they might be able to cope with what they're going to be seeing and hearing during trial. The second is post-verdict debriefing led by either a judge or a clinician or both. And this is in a group setting post-verdict, giving uh, all the jurors the opportunity to discuss what they all just went through together, um, also giving them some ideas on how to cope with their, their stress, perhaps in the short term and the long term. And then third, perhaps, perhaps most effective then is um, counseling, jurors being offered a, a series of counseling sessions. And this actually isn't 
um, all that popular in the literature that I have found. There are not a lot of states and jurisdictions that are that are offering this. Um, one notable exception is Wisconsin did a pilot study looking at the effectiveness of offering post-trial counseling and found that it in fact is quite effective. Alaska is the only state that has legislation at this point, I believe, that mandates some uh, counseling on the dime of the state. Uh, but the problem with that, and this speaks to what Robbie got to, which is the counseling sessions have to be used right away. The counseling that's mandated there, counseling sessions, they're free to extras, but they have to be used within several months. And it may turn out that um, people aren't ready to talk about it for several months, if not years, as Robbie mentioned. And so what me and my research team at Wofford were interested in uh, looking into was what judges think about this. So uh, in the first study that I'm presenting here, we did interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with, with, uh, with jurors, which there's not a lot of that in the literature. It's a lot of surveys, um, but we wanted to do one-on-one -on -one interviews with judges asking them about what they thought about what jurors go through. So we had uh, 13, judges, um, circuit court judges in the state of South Carolina. We did one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. We designed a 14-item uh, semi-structured interview uh, that we conducted that took about 30 minutes. And we asked them things like, what do you think are the biggest sources of stress that jurors experience? Do you think they might experience stress in the long term? What do you think about these debriefing programs that are being implemented? So I'm just presenting some of the key findings today. So we asked, what are the typical sources of stress for jurors during a trial? What do you think, judges? What do you think are the typical sources of stress? And here's how the results broke down. Um, the biggest one that was mentioned here was courtroom procedures. So being unfamiliar with the courtroom environment, um, insecurities about the law, also um, the emotionality of the experience, the shock of being involved in a trial, um, feeling empathy or sympathy for people um, that are testifying. Of course, uh, deliberation was also something that the judges thought uh, really weighed heavily on jurors. We asked judges, do you think stress or trauma could affect a juror's participation in the trial process? And over half answered yes. And of those that answered yes, we then asked how. How do you think stress affects jurors um, and their participation? And so here were the answers that we got. We grouped them into these groups. Um, this one here, decision making. Um, judges were concerned that really it could affect their decision-making ability. Maybe that's going to introduce bias into the jury process, into the deliberation process and influence other, other jurors. It might cause them to doubt their own abilities in the courtroom and they might lose focus. Here we asked whether judges had witnessed reactions from jurors that led them to believe a juror was having a difficult time. And most of them said yes. So we asked, um, what kinds of things, what kinds of things did you notice jurors doing that would lead you to believe that? And so things like um, averting their eyes when there was difficult testimony being presented or graphic photographs, uh, jurors crying, jurors uh, being panicked, um, emotional out, outburst, anxiety, et cetera. And, uh, and then we asked if jurors, if judges thought that jurors might continue to experience negative symptoms post-trial. Do you think they're going to continue having symptoms? And most thought that this was a, a possibility. And so um, after this, after we completed this study, uh, I wanted to turn to judges' experiences, their own experiences with many of these same things. Um, what is the potential for judges to experience secondary um, traumatic stress uh, based on their work? And my specific interest is in the things that they experience in the courtroom. And so I dug into the literature to see what kind of research had already been done in this area. 
And there's been several recent studies, several studies looking at different sources of stress. So here's the kinds of things that judges tend to say lead them to um, have higher levels of stress, the impact of their decisions, <clears throat> having a heavy workload, dealing with unprepared attorneys, repeatedly presiding over the same case with no resolution, worrying about their own personal safety, and then um, the kinds of things they're confronting in the courtroom during the course of a trial, gruesome evidence, and emotional family court situations. And of course, they are also at risk of negative outcomes, that uh, uh, things that affect their job satisfaction, their likelihood for depression or anxiety, and ultimately burnout. And all of that, their own stress response varies as a function of how supportive uh, how supported they might feel, their age, gender, coping ability, all of those affect the likelihood of experiencing those symptoms. And of course, ABA's recent publication um, outlining some coping mechanisms that might be beneficial, hotlines, mentorship programs, sabbaticals. And so I was interested in following up on this research, again, doing some one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I do think similar to um, the idea of jurors, I think conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can get a um, more, uh, you can go deeper with those interviews than you can in, in a survey type of situation. So here we were able to interview 18 circuit court judges in South Carolina and North Carolina, and we asked them um, items from a 15 item uh, semi-structured interview that we de developed, spent about half an hour with each judge. And we asked them things like, uh, things about sources, what are your sources of, of stress? Uh, what do you think the, the stress does to you both mentally and physically? And how do you try to manage that stress? And so here are the, some of the findings from this research. So we asked, what are the top sources of stress as it pertains to hearing a case? Again, that's my interest in is what's happening to judges based on the kinds of things they're dealing with in the courtroom specifically. And so you can see on the left-hand side of the graphs, uh, what are the top sources of stress that judges said uh, they're, they're experiencing? Things related to children, the weight of making decisions in the, in the courtroom, making life-altering decisions, um, overseeing, how the court is functioning, and of course, trauma in the courtroom, gruesome evidence and emotional testimony. Those are kind of at the top of the list here. We asked judges, are there certain kinds of cases or evidence that impact you emotionally? So on the left here, here we have the type of case. So at the top of the list was anything related to children, anything involving abuse, murder, what kind of evidence impacts you the most emotionally, gruesome evidence, anything related to, to children is at the top of the list there. We asked judges, in what ways does your work affect you physically and emotionally? And we didn't know, I didn't know if judges would be willing to be forthcoming when it came to these two questions in particular, but um, to my surprise, they were all very willing to answer these questions. And so here's some of the physical symptoms on the left that they listed, the ways that they're impacted physically. At the top of the list was trouble sleeping, fatigue, high blood pressure. Some said they're not affected physically. Emotionally here on the right, uh, many said they felt isolated. They, they could no longer connect with their, for instance, their friends with they, that they used to be uh, the attorneys they used to be friends with when they were attorneys, um, that they, they couldn't talk with them about uh, their cases and what they were experiencing, um, irritability, being, being anxious, overwhelmed. Some said they don't experience any emotional symptoms. We asked what strategies they use to manage or reduce their, um, their work stress. At the top of what they mentioned was exercise, hobbies, time with loved ones, reading, distraction, trying to distract themselves, being in a good routine. And then last, we asked what they thought about the possibility of um, stress reduction strategies at the organizational level, things that could be offered to them. Would, would this be helpful on the left? And um, most thought that yes, or maybe this could be helpful. And we asked, well, what kinds of things would you like to see? And at the top of that list was workshops, educational programs, also having 
having time off. So to wrap this up, when it comes to jurors and the potential for uh, secondary traumatic stress, overall from our research with South Carolina judges, they're clearly, clearly they're in tune with the fact that there's, there's the potential for um, some real troubles when it comes to what jurors are experiencing. And um, this is a great quote from Les Leslie 2017. It is time to reform the age old jury selection process to bring it in line with our modern awareness of mental health issues especially since jurors are duty bound to serve if selected, despite the risk of injury to their mental health. So it's obvious that the stress associated with jury duty can result in really serious negative effects on physical health and mental health. I think we need to think very seriously about what jurors need um, if we're going to ask them to um, be involved in in trials that they don't have a choice over. And um, similar to what Robbie mentioned, they may need immediate and delayed counseling in order to help treat what they went through in their um, experience. And when it comes to judges susceptibility to uh, secondary traumatic stress, I think this is an understudied area and there needs to be more research, it's going to be important for research to start examining perhaps how decision-making might be affected by long-term um, stress over the course of a judge's career. Uh, we might need to start talking about really the efficacy of workshop sabbaticals, et cetera, to help reduce judicial stress and um, find more information on whether these are, are practical at helping jurors or judges. Um, this is ongoing research in its infancy. I would love to talk with anybody who has interests in this area. Um, I'm, I myself am on sabbatical this semester and I'm um, spending a lot of time thinking about what the next step are and what needs to be done empirically. And I would love to talk with anybody who's interested in, in this area. And I also want to acknowledge this research could not have been done without all of the people listed on this slide. I had two excellent teams of Wofford researchers and students who helped conduct these interviews on the left-hand side, especially big shout out to Abby Brasington and Dylan Hooper, who we wrote a joint article reflecting these findings together. And then on the right-hand side, Alyssa Rogers and Aaron Tinkler, um, we will be presenting these data at a conference, the American Psychology Law Society coming up soon. Uh, Chelsea McNeil, Circuit Defender, 8th Judicial Circuit in South Carolina, as well as Professor Mark Rabel, they uh, helped us get in touch with the judges who, um, thank you to all of the judges who helped us um, out with this research. We couldn't have done it, done it without you. So that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, for listening to, to that. And I want to now introduce the second person who's up. Actually, it's a group of people who are up next. I wanna introduce Mark Rabel from Wake Forest School of Law, Dr. Stephanie Walker-Seaton from Wake Forest School of Medicine, Kimberly Wiseman from the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Um, and I, the four of us are involved in another study of secondary trauma um, focused specifically on capital defense attorneys. We've been spending the last several months developing a survey to be sent out to capital defense attorneys. So I want to ask Mark, Stephanie, Kimberly to turn their, uh, their cameras on and their volumes on. And I'm gonna hand it over to them to talk about their project. Thanks so much, Don. Um... Yes, yeah, sabbatical. I think that's the overarching answer to everything that we're going to talk about today. Everybody needs to take a break from this stuff at some point because we don't we don't realize what's going on. We're we're going to be probably the briefest panel because we, even though we've been working on this um, for a while, uh, we've only just sent a survey out to capital defenders in North Carolina. We actually started talking about this a few years ago when I made a presentation at the medical school to uh, a group organized by Dr. Mark Wolfson, who's now gone on to uh, teach in uh, San Diego. But uh, uh, Stephanie Seaton and Kimberly Wiseman have wonderfully agreed to assist uh, uh, with this particular project. So here's how it came about. 
I mean, as I've already talked about, and as Larry Hammond talked about in the in the very first uh, comments that we had in this symposium today, I and Larry realized that secondary trauma is a thing. It affects our work. It affects our partners. It affects our children. As we heard from Robbie, it affects jurors. It affects lots of people around us. And so one of the remedies would be to understand how we are affected. Can we document that there is an effect? In researching this several years ago, when I first started, I found that there was a study done of public defenders in the state of Wisconsin. And in that study, which was uh, the type of study that we're doing and that uh, Professor Lindsay Harris is gonna talk about here in a few minutes, uh, there's uh, certain scales that are put together that I'll ask these guys about in just a second here. And uh, in order to document whether people are suffering from either secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, fatigue, and those sorts of things. And we, wa we uh, wanted to compare how capital defenders do in comparison to public defenders in Wisconsin who handled violent uh, cases. In other words, they had to defend violent cases. And there was a definite increase in fatigue, burnout, substance abuse, marital difficulties, all of the things that you don't want to happen because of your job. But after that, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of studies there. Now there are some that are beginning to be done. So I asked um, these guys to help me figure out how we could do this scientifically so that we could show that, yeah, this, this is a thing. And we actually sent out yesterday after um, a lot of, we had to get a lot of different approvals from the Institutional Review Board in order to be able to, I guess, experiment on people. It's not really experimentation, but it comes within the purview of that. But uh, let me ask first, uh, Stephanie Seaton. And by the way, Stephanie has uh, um, she's got her PhD in psychology and law with a minor in statistics from the University of Wyoming. She uh, has experience as a professor, department chair, research associate, and currently is with the medical school here at Wake Forest in the Department of Public Health Sciences and Wake Forest University's bioethics program. And uh, Kimberly Wiseman has a master's in psychology also from Wyoming and has 10 years uh, conducting mix, mixed methods research in psychology, law, and public health. And she's also at the medical school here at Wake Forest. Um, maybe, uh, Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about how, how we design this? And then we'll talk to Kimberly about um, whether within 24 hours we have any results from our, from our survey yet. Yeah, absolutely. Kimberly, I think, has some slides available. Um, quickly, while she's pulling those up, I want to thank those from the first panel for sharing your stories and emphasizing the importance of mental health care. I really appreciate that. Um, as Mark said, we, with most research, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So we, we pulled most of these scales um, from that Wisconsin study. The first is the positive and negative affect schedule the short version, PANIS is what it's referred to. And that measures your positive and negative feelings. And it was invented by Edmund Thompson in 2007. We have the Sheehan Disability Scale or SDS, and that assesses your functional impairment in worker school, social and family life created by Sheehan in 1983. We have the Satisfaction with Life Scale um, created by a diner and all, um, in 1985, and that measures your global life satisfaction. We have the Professional Quality of Life Scale created by Henry Stamm and his colleagues in 1995. And that measures compassion satisfaction, burnout, and compassion fatigue, which is obviously related to secondary trauma. Um, we have the Impact of Event Scale revised. This evaluates distress one feels in response to trauma um, created by Daniel Weiss in 2007. And finally, we have the Center for Epidemiologic S Studies Depression Scale, or CESD, which screens for depression. And that was created by Radloff clear back in 1977. So I'm gonna take it from here. Um, I was able to pop into the data last night and um, we have 16 completes. So um, a very, very small sample so far. 
Um, but I wanted to kind of share just a little, a little bit um, with us since we had some data. So um, like I said, 16 completes, we had an additional seven that were partial completes. Um, and first looking at some of the demographics, we can see that so far the sample is heavily male, um, heavily white, and the average age is about 59 years old. And when you look at the years of experience, the sample so far is also pretty heavily skewed into um, heavily experienced um, capital defense attorneys. Um, I'm also going to show uh, some outcome data, but I just wanted to give a caveat before I do, um, you know, this is a very, very small sample. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm going to show the data, but obviously um, we're not really drawing any conclusions at this point. And um, the trends are obviously probably going to change as we continue to have more people fill out the survey. Um, so here is a preliminary look at some data um, with that caveat. We, um, I looked at the percent of the sample experiencing significant PTSD symptoms as measured by that impact of event scale. And um, in our sample, which is the uh, gray bar on the left, we have about 21% of the sample experiencing significant PTSD symptoms. And then I wanted to compare that to the Wisconsin Public Defenders from the Levin study that Mark referenced. Um, and so in that study, they had about 11% of their sample. Um, I also looked at um, the percent of the sample experiencing significant secondary traumatic stress as measured with the um, professional quality of life scale. And in our study, we've got about 25% so far experiencing um, that si significant secondary traumatic stress. And that's as compared to the blue bar in the Levin study, which is um, 34%. So, um, you know, like I said, this is just a very, very quick dip into our very small sample so far. Um, but, you know, we're continuing to collect data. We're in the field right now. And um, we'll be doing a very deep dive of everything we collect and um, publish a paper in, in the future. So this, that's sort of, sort of where we are right now. Mark, I know you hadn't seen any of this. Do you have any follow-up questions? Uh, no, I thank you guys so much. Uh, I know that's a very small sample. We sent out about 300 and some uh, surveys to people that are on the list in North Carolina to defend capital cases, including Office of the Capital Defender as well as private attorneys and public defenders. Um, a couple of observations. Uh, yeah, since it's mostly the old guys like me, they're mostly white, which is, uh, you know, and like I said, we're going to talk about race this afternoon, but this is a this is a huge factor, and hopefully some of our studies uh, with this capital defender study will talk about race and gender in terms of how people experience things. And I know Professor Harris in the next talk is is definitely going to talk about that. The other thing is that through I don't know if you want to call it a kink in the works, and maybe Stephanie or Kimberly could comment on this, but you know we didn't know the pandemic was going to happen when it did, and so some of our questions had to be retrospective to prior to the pandemic, how were you feeling about this, that, and the other? Um, either one of you guys have any comment about the pandemic factor? I'll just, I'll just speak on it briefly. Um, we did, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Modify, I guess, the questions um, to try to relate to a more typical time period. So for example, a, um, one of the scales might have asked, you know, how often did you feel this within the past week? And so we did modify those items to how often did you feel this in a typical week, you know, prior to COVID sort of, um, we had a disclaimer, you know, that we encouraged participants to um, think about their experiences in sort of the pre-COVID world where things were more quote unquote normal. Thank you guys. Uh I want to say we're continuing to work on that North Carolina Capital Defender Study. We intend to do it as well in other states like Arizona.
uh, in which there, there are active death penalties to see if there's comparisons, uh, similarities, or differences. For all you funders out there who would like to help out with that, please let us know because these things, you know, are resource uh, heavy and we could certainly use some help. Uh, I'm also working with the Innocence Network, which is a combination of the 70 some innocence organizations around the United States that deal with innocence cases. And uh, we'd like to do a study of all of the innocence attorneys and staff people as well. And uh, eventually also the, uh, with capital defense and with innocence, people who are not lawyers like paralegals and investigators, fellows, uh, law students, that sort of thing. But I think we'll, you know, we'll certainly write all this up. A lot of these will be written up in the law review that's gonna be published. I think some of this stuff about the North Carolina Capital Defender Study will also be more of a, a research type article in a psychological journal in, in a little more scientific way so that it could be relied on in your workers' comp cases when you sue for uh, occupational disease uh, as part of your job. Uh, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, I'm just hinting maybe it might be relevant. Hopefully more to make reforms. But Don, I think probably great to get on to um, Lindsay, thank you, Kimberly and Stephanie and Don. I, did did you have anything else to add? I'm sorry, I was just I was rushing. No, that's okay. I the only thing that, you, that was great, and um, Kimberly, I'm excited that you were able to put together some results very quickly. So thank you for presenting that. Um, so I just I wanted to add that uh, there might be people watching now that your email, Mark, was sent to yesterday. So I think we all want to ask that. Um, it would be great if you filled that survey out and got it back to us as soon as possible because we're anxious to dig into the data. Um, anything else, Mark? Or No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks to Mark, Kimberly, and Stephanie uh, for that presentation. And we're going to move on to the last presentation and hopefully have a few minutes for questions at the end. Next up is going to be Lindsay Harris. So Lindsay, can you please turn your camera on and your volume on? There you are, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay Harris is an associate professor and director of the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic at the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. She will discuss a study of secondary trauma focused on immigration attorneys. Thank you so much, Dr. McQuiston. And I'm just setting up my slides, but I wanted to start by thanking the Wake Forest Law Review for having me for this uh, incredible symposium today on a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I think critically important to how we lawyer and how we train law students. So today I'm going to talk to you about a survey of 718 asylum attorneys in 2020 focused on assessing burnout and secondary trauma. I myself am an asylum attorney, so I'm essentially studying myself. And I just want to start by saying it's very intimidating to be speaking alongside research psychologists with PhDs who research uh, these issues and talk and write about them. So just going to take a deep breath and start talking into the small screen in my basement. So thank you for having me. Um, asylum attorneys are one subset of immigration attorneys. So there have been studies done on uh, family lawyers, on public defenders, as has been mentioned today, and lawyers practicing other areas of law. There really hasn't been any work done on immigration attorneys. There's been one study of immigration judges back in 2007, 2008 that my work builds on. But asylum attorneys, uh, essentially immigration attorneys practice, uh, could practice many different areas within immigration laws from business immigration to family immigration, family-based petitions, to removal defense in immigration court, which may include asylum work, to other humanitarian work, including U visas and T visas for victims of crime and victims of trafficking. So in focusing on asylum attorneys, I'm not saying that other immigration attorneys or attorneys more broadly may not offer, also be suffering from uh, secondary trauma and burnout, but I did decide to zero in on this one specific population. And I'd like to start by telling you why. And in doing that, I want to tell you a little bit about the asylum seeking process in case you're not familiar with it. Thanks to the Trump administration, I think many more people these days know what I mean when I say I'm an asylum lawyer. They don't think I'm working with people maybe inside an insane asylum was, was sometimes the assumption. People have more of a sense of what an asylum seeker is and what the asylum seeking process may involve. Uh, but I wanna set up what it is and how it may 
mean that asylum attorneys are especially vulnerable to potentially suffering from secondary trauma and burnout. So most asylum seekers themselves are trauma survivors, survivors of torture or trauma. They then come to the US and have to go through an inherently traumatic process. Uh, they are required to, uh, as has been mentioned this morning, retell and relive the worst moments of their lives over and over again in great detail. That is required to establish credibility for the adjudicator, the immigration judge, or the asylum officer to believe them and to grant them asylum. Asylum seekers may also be subject to highly dehumanizing detention conditions, uh, which have only been exacerbated further by the COVID-19 pandemic. These cases are also very high stakes cases. So we've, called a lot, uh, we've talked a lot about death penalty and capital offense cases today. In asylum cases, the consequences of someone being returned to a place where they face persecution or torture or death are very high. Um, so there, they are, um, as one immigration judge has said, uh, Judge Dana Marks uh, has said, uh, asylum cases or immigration court is like uh, cases with death penalty stakes in traffic court. So the demand for services is also incredibly high. So asylum attorneys are unable to meet that demand for pro bono, low bono, or even paid uh, services. And asylum seekers themselves are not eligible for any kind of federal benefits while they go through the asylum seeking process and very rarely any state benefits too. So they're really struggling to adjust to life in the US with the trauma they've suffered back home in the home country, often also the traumatic journey to the US and then what they've faced since arriving here. And they often have no access to work authorization for a long period of time and I could talk for hours on that. Um, so they have no real way to support themselves. So very vulnerable uh, individuals who are incredibly resilient and strong, but also really at risk of exploitation. And they are immigration court backlogs um, and backlogs at the asylum office. I mean, these cases can go on from anywhere from, you know, one to 10 years, <laughs> essentially. Really, really a backlog delayed system. You also have a fairly dysfunctional system where there's a phenomenon called refugee roulette where there are disparities in adjudication. So an asylum seeker in Atlanta, Georgia, for example, or Charlotte, North Carolina, may have a less than 2% chance of being granted asylum ultimately by an immigration judge, whereas uh, asylum seekers in other jurisdictions like maybe New York or San Francisco uh, may have a much higher rate. Some judges have a 80% grant rate for asylum cases, for example. Uh, finally, there's this issue that asylum doesn't actually cure all ills. It doesn't actually remedy the human rights abuses that have heard. All it gives the asylum seeker, if granted asylum, is the opportunity to rebuild their lives again in a new place. It does not, uh, the perpetrators of the harm of the human rights violations that have occurred are not brought to task or there's no justice in any sense there. And the underlying root causes of the human rights abuses themselves are not addressed. Um, so attorneys, in the survey that I did put out and 718 attorneys consented and responded completely, so there, that's the data set I'm working with, um, did share in the one open-ended question at the end of the survey, feelings of feeling complicit in a dysfunctional system that many of them uh, found, and I would agree here, is <laughs> xenophobic and racist. So this is all, all of this that I've just described is pre-Trump administration. So all of this uh, was happening before the Trump administration. The last four years have made it even more difficult to seek asylum, uh, to be granted asylum, and to go through the process of accessing counsel and obtaining asylum. Um, so I'll just go over this briefly, and I've written a whole different article on this. It's called Asylum Under Attack. If you want to Google it, it's available on SSRN. But from turning people back at the border um, at the end of the Obama administration and the beginning of the Trump administration, uh, metering, which means just a very few number of people are, are allowed in on one day or none very often, uh, to family separation, which really catapulted asylum seekers and immigration issues into the spotlight in 2018 when that policy came to light and Jeff Sessions uh, started uh, overseeing the policy that separated families at the border, ripping children, infants from the arms of their parents um, through the zero tolerance policy, zero tolerance for uh, unlawful border crossing. So entering without papers. Um, that's actually permissible for asylum seekers. There's nothing illegal about coming and seeking asylum without documentation. There's no way to get that documentation or to seek asylum outside the US. 
Uh, the Trump administration also put in place asylum bans, and I won't get into detail on what that means really, but essentially restrictions on people who do enter between ports of entry, even though they weren't allowed to enter at ports of entry to seek asylum. And then also restrictions on people who had transited or gone through other countries before coming to the US. You may have heard of the Migrant Protection Protocols or the Remain in Mexico program, which advocates often call the, the Migrant Persecution Protocols because it had led to more than 65,000 people uh, being sent back to Mexico while they awaited their US immigration court cases to claim asylum and in very dangerous, precarious conditions um, subject to uh, targeting by cartels and other organizations that were literally preying on people waiting at the border to come into the US. Um, there's been a series of attorney general decisions uh, from the various attorney generals who served under Trump to undermine protection specifically focused at people fleeing gender and gang related violence, as well as agreements that have now been suspended by the Biden administration State Department with the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala to basically send asylum seekers to those countries instead of allowing them to go through the US process. There were fees uh, introduced and uh, they, they tried to put fees in place for seeking asylum, which has never existed before in the US and, and not many places in the world. New rules for work permits to delay access to work, uh, really pedantic, persnickety rejections of applications for asylum based on, for example, failing to list the location, uh, geographic location of your deceased relative um, on the form. You know, what do you put in that box? Um, so again, an inherently traumatic process that was made worse in the last four years. There's also been the, the COVID ban under Title 42 of the Public Health Act at the border that has literally stopped asylum at our southern border um, and is essentially still in effect today. And then there's been an onslaught of proposed regulations. I think I counted 19 sets um, over the last couple of years focused on asylum and focused on restricting access to asylum and making it more difficult to access asylum. So these are not even all of the, the actions under the Trump administration that were aimed at dismantling asylum protection, but it gives you an idea and essentially attorneys, asylum attorneys have been navigating all of this. It literally changes every day. Um, it might ch have changed today, right now, while I've been speaking to you in the last 10 minutes. So my question was, going into this research, uh, having been personally affected by, by doing this work, working with trauma survivors, but then also just the trauma of the system, was what does this mean for the advocates? And I did focus on attorneys here. I would love to do broader studies um, where I could focus on paralegals, accredited representatives, uh, support staff, uh, social workers, all those who are supporting and making this work possible for attorneys, who also may be more directly affected than attorneys. Some attorneys assign support staff to actually sit with clients and draft their detailed declarations of what they have endured and what they fear um, for, to support their asylum claim. So I started to look at this and I wouldn't say there's been mainstream media attention on this, but there has been some media attention. Um, some, some media are starting to pay attention to this issue, um, looking at immigration attorneys and burnout. Immigration attorneys leaving the profession uh, quite quickly um, because of the stresses that they were feeling. So in 2020, and again, I didn't mean to uh, launch my study during a pandemic either, but I did. So in 2020, I launched this survey and it was, I came up with the questions in conjunction with Dr. Stuart Lustig, who had been part of a prior study of immigration judges back in 2007, 2008. So my study uses the same, same two scales that they used in that study. So I could kind of compare immigration judges versus this subset of immigration attorneys. So 718 asylum attorneys completed the survey. Um, between February 25th and May 15th, 2020. So there's kind of about half um, who completed the survey before what, what we determined as the lockdown period, kind of maybe March 13th was the date we decided to divide kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID. And obviously this is also just during the first few months of the pandemic. Um, I'm not gonna share a ton of uh, results on that other than to say, interestingly, the rates of burnout and secondary trauma were actually a bit lower um, during the pandemic times. And there's lots of reasons why that might be, why lawyering became uh, more stressful and less stressful during that time. For a lot of people uh, during that specific period, the immigration courts did slow down a bit. The asylum office shut down. So they were probably having less actual exposure and contact with their clients and with the traumatic stories that they would be hearing. 
Um, and also commutes would uh, definitely would have been reduced. There was a little bit more time for family or less, depending on your situation. I have two young kids, two and six. So definitely them being home didn't lead to me having more time. And I'm sure many of you, that resonates with many of you. Um, but for colleagues who do a lot of detention work, for example, that became increasingly stressful as we literally fought to and are still fighting to get clients released from immigration detention who have pre-existing conditions or who are especially vulnerable or just in detention during, during this pandemic. Um, so it wasn't a huge effect, but it was actually interesting that burnout and secondary trauma were slightly reduced in the population of attorneys, about half who took it post-COVID. Post um, so I used questions. Uh, using the Copenhagen burnout inventory and the secondary traumatic stress scale. And I'll tell you a little bit of that. And one open-ended question at the end of the survey I had about 321 responses. So 321 people wrote in and shared something at the end. And I'll share a couple of those responses with you, but they're incredibly rich. Um, and then the beginning part of the survey focused on attorney characteristics. So kind of some demographics around the age of the attorney, race and ethnicity, um, gender and gender identity. Uh, the circuit courts that they practiced before. So which jurisdiction they're in by circuit, um, their office size and type. So solo practitioners versus academics like me who teach in a clinical setting um, versus nonprofit practitioners, people who are in small firms, large firms, medium firms, um, to get a sense of how that might affect levels of, of secondary trauma and burnout. Also how many support staff they had and then the volume of asylum cases they're actually handling. So the number of cases on their docket as well as their estimated weekly work hours. So those are all the factors that we tried to consider. So just to share with you um, a couple of responses, and these are, I'm not being dramatic here, these are pretty symbolic and representative of the wider set of 300 responses. So here's what one attorney wrote at the end of the survey. I think this administration has created a generation of public service workers with serious PTSD from the absolute chaos and the horror of the changes in the immigration system. It feels like we're all drowning and there's no one to save us. So really honing in there on the, the effects of the Trump administration specifically. Um, there were attorneys who wrote and said, I've been doing this since you know 1982 and this is the worst it's ever been. Um, there were a few people who wrote that in. Another attorney shared, it's like hacking away at a cement wall with a plastic spoon. There are no walls to describe how awful it is to tell a client they have to go back to the place where they're in so much danger that the law doesn't protect them, especially after we grow so close to our clients. So I'm just sharing a couple of those quotes to give a little bit of texture um, to the numbers I'm about to share. Um, but before I do, I'll just explain these two scales very briefly. And the previous presenters shared some other tools that have been used. But again, I use these two scales specifically because there had been uh, one study at least done in the immigration arena. So the Copenhagen burnout inventory is on, um, measures kind of three uh, dimensions of burnout. And then it also gives you an overall score. And the score is on a scale of zero to 100. And I am not a math person, so I'm doing my best with presenting this to you all. I have a fantastic co-author, Dr. Hilary Mellinger, who has helped me to understand all of this and who ran our regression analyses. And you know, I had to look up what an regression analysis even was. So bear with me. Uh, I just want to share with you the, the dimensions of burnout that the scale measures. Um, so first, personal burnout. And personal burnout is the kind of the degree of physical and psychological fatigue and exhaustion experienced by the person who's being surveyed. Then you have work burnout, which is that same thing, but perceived as the person as related to their work. And then client burnout. And that basically is that the people work and it refers to the extent that individuals here, asylum attorneys, may feel frustrated or exhausted as a result of working with clients. Um, here, that would be asylum seekers. Um, so the second scale we used was the secondary traumatic stress scale. And as Professor Rabel and others have mentioned, secondary traumatic stress often mirrors PTSD symptoms. Um, so for PTSD diagnosis, you would need to have symptoms of intrusion, arousal, and avoidance. And then there's also an overall secondary traumatic stress score. And this is on a one to five scale, so different numbers. Um, so there's 19 questions in this scale and they basically measure you know, intrusion, focusing on intrusive thoughts, maybe nightmares or unintentionally thinking about your client related work during non-work hours. Um, for me actually as a, as a survivor of trauma myself, I think of this as when you lose the ability to decide when you get to think about that traumatic event or exposure that you've had. Um, avoidance, that's pretty understandable, kind of avoiding working on, on, on your cases or work. And then arousal, thinking here about things like hypervigilance or sleep disturbance, feeling very restless, um, etc. 
So I'll share with you these numbers. Again, I am not a statistics person and I rely heavily on Dr. Mellinger as my, my co-author here. Um, in terms of the overall findings uh, on secondary trauma and burnout, asylum attorneys scored highly on both scales. And so I want to do, what I want to do here is show you a couple of comparisons with other professions and other helping professions who've taken the same kind of test and, and they have an, a mean score overall. Um, so first, on this slide, I have asylum attorneys compared with prison wardens, hospital doctors, nurses, social workers, and midwives who've, who've taken the same Cop Copenhagen burnout inventory. And I'm looking at the work burnout here. So how burnt out are you physically, emotionally um, exhausted by your work? And as you can see, asylum attorneys are at the bottom and they're about 63 on the scale of zero to 100 versus you know midwives or prison wardens, um, everybody else is in kind of the 30 to um, 42, 43 range. Immigration judges are very high too. Um, so they were about 56 on the scale when that population was surveyed. And this is just, of course, the asylum attorneys actually surveyed and we can't really generalize to everybody, but I think it's still uh, quite helpful to see these numbers. And then similarly on the personal burnout, asylum attorneys, again, are higher than everybody else. Um, all the other populations I could find that have taken this specific burnout assessment tool. Um, they're still uh, you know, about 10 points higher on the scale than immigration judges. They're much higher than hospital doctors, right? And, and there's been studies of ER doctors working with people coming in and experiencing trauma. It's the same thing. Asylum attorneys are really high um, on this scale. Um, and the client burnout scale, they are the highest again, but not as high, which is interesting here. So you can see the other two scales on work and personal burnout, they were about 20 points higher than most of the other professions. Here it's just a couple points higher than the immigration judges. And, you know, I don't know why that is, but I, a lot of attorneys spontaneously wrote in that the survey seemed designed to say that this was all about the clients and the exposure to the clients and the trauma. And they wanted to make clear that it wasn't the clients. It wasn't hearing the traumatic stories. It was the system and the dysfunction of the system. Um, so on secondary traumatic stress, I just have a comparator with immigration judges. But again, asylum attorneys scored much higher on the scale of one to five than immigration judges did. And, um, you know, this is not actually surprising. So Dr. McQuiston talked about uh, her research on judges, and I don't want to minimize uh, secondary trauma in judges, but, uh, and the judges still score, score higher than other helping professions here who are in immigration court, those judges. But the asylum attorneys, it kind of makes sense that they would have higher secondary trauma because they're working very directly for hours on end to prepare testimony for court with asylum seekers. Um, and immigration judges are essentially just hearing that neatly packaged testimony on the day of the trial. So I'll just end by sharing um, a couple of thoughts on the attorney characteristics that we looked like. So consistent with other studies of lawyers in the past um, in Canada and the US and various lawyer attorney populations, um, our average scores for females definitely uh, were higher on both burnout and secondary traumatic stress. And I learned today that this is the same with jury members. So we need to especially be concerned about female identifying attorneys. Um, also, every non-white group of attorneys measured higher on both scales than white attorneys. So I'm really interested to hear about the panel this afternoon thinking about race and secondary trauma, because that's definitely something coming from my study and some other studies. Um, higher age, however, actually reflected lower stress levels. And I'll leave it to you to imagine uh, why that might be. And then the other findings, um, so this is probably not surprising to you either, but solo practitioners responding to the survey reported higher levels of secondary trauma than other attorneys in small, medium firms, nonprofits, or academia. Having zero support staff also definitely made a difference. And those with no support staff had much higher levels of both. And as you might imagine, um, weekly hours were predictive of higher secondary traumatic stress scores, but actually not statistically significant for higher burnout. So that was an interesting finding. Um, maybe those folks have kind of figured out ways to, to manage that. Um, one thing, you know, some things we didn't look at that we should in future studies are kind of supervision and does that make a difference? Uh, prior to a trauma in attorneys' lives, right? Are those of us who have suffered any trauma in our lives um, especially affected? Prior studies do suggest that that is the case. And then, you know, especially uh, important in the last year, kind of having children or having other child caregiving responsibilities and how that might affect things. So 
I will just say, you know, I wasn't surprised by these results, um, having worked in this field for a while, um, but I think it's valuable to have some data around these phenomena. And I've suggested areas for further research, but I'm looking forward to the next panel where we'll be talking about what we should do about clearly documented stress levels and burnout in, in asylum attorneys, likely if we studied them immigration attorneys more broadly and, and attorneys practicing other areas of law. Um, I think that in immigration, solving some of the dysfunction and unfairness in the system is very important. We need an Article One independent immigration court so that we're not as subject to the whims of the political branch in terms of our immigration system. But beyond that, we need to normalize these discussions around our emotional responses to lawyering. And that starts in law school and thinking about our clinical and non-clinical curricula, but it also extends to the legal profession and thinking about how our institutions state bar associations, professional membership or organizations, and then employers at every level um, in the system, what we need to do in order to properly address, prevent, and then mitigate symptoms of burnout and secondary trauma. So I'll stop here and I'm really thankful to be here. I also just want to acknowledge that none of the work I've done and I'm happy to share my draft article would have been possible without my mother flying from California and moving to this the DC area to care for my child um, and during remote school in the pandemic. So a big thank you to her and my husband for their support and to my institution for some summer research funding last year. Um, but thank you so much and I look forward to any questions. Great. Lindsay, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. And I know we have about eight minutes for questions. Um, questions have been coming in to the conference organizers, and um, I have a few that I'm going to ask. So if, if all of the panelists from panel two would go ahead and be on camera, go ahead and show your videos and unmute yourselves so we can all answer some questions. And there's a, there's a few that I think have uh, very, probably pretty quick answers. Um, let's cover those uh, first. Have you considered specifically targeting and reaching out to capital defenders of color from outside of North Carolina in order to create a more representative sample? So Lindsay mentioned this in her talk just now. There's going to be uh, a panel on this this afternoon, but uh, Mark or Stephanie or Kimberly, um, anything to add to that? Well, I think when we reach out to other states, that'll they'll be included. Um, but that, that's a good question, though. We'll have to think about that because it's a whole different set of issues. I mean, great in the sense of when I first started doing capital cases in the 1980s, there were maybe one or two black attorneys, and it has only very gradually increased. It was mostly white guys like me, and then you know women started being added in really only in the last. 20 years with you know obviously some exceptions but yeah it's been a it's been a white male thing and i think there are reasons for that that we'll go into this afternoon i'll just add sorry in the immigration context studies show that 65 percent of immigration attorneys working full-time are actually white women so it's actually a more female dominated profession and my study does reflect that and you know we had a good number of uh, we, there are 154 people who responded to the survey identified as Latinx or Hispanic, um, but some of the other numbers were very, very low in terms of Black attorneys um, or Middle Eastern attorneys doing this work. Great. Um, here's another question. Why do you think states are so resistant to provide post-trial counseling? Is it cost, lack of knowledge about the problem, stigma? Uh, Mark might have additional thoughts about this. All of you might have additional thoughts about this. I would say uh, in, my, uh, in my research and conversations with, with judges, um, yes, I think it's the idea that um, there isn't money. There, there isn't money to provide something like this. Um, and interestingly, uh, to add to that, I think it was the uh, the pilot study that I talked about. Was it was I think it was Wisconsin um, did a pilot study uh, looking at the effectiveness of of providing counseling to ex jurors, and their conclusion was that it's really a small subset of jurors that we're talking about here. When you think about the the cases that are going to involve the kind of evidence that we're talking about, this isn't every trial. It's really a small subset of jurors that we would need to, that the courts would need to provide this for. And so it really might not be the kind of expense that the courts 
think that it might be. Um, anybody have anything to add to that? I, th I think that's right. Uh, I think largely it's a matter of expense and, and awareness. Um, you know, I, as a traditionally a death penalty lawyer, I would probably say there's also a fear that uh, creating evidence of trauma of jurors could create some sort of argument that the death penalty is unconstitutional. Um, that would be my personal opinion that that makes it cruel or unusual if it affects the people in the system that way. But I think most judges and people in the system are just not aware of it. And if they were, they would certainly want to protect the jurors. So I think it's not only the capital cases, but particularly as we've already heard some from Andrea about the sex, the sex cases. Sex cases with children are absolutely the worst. They're like, you know, homicide cases with children are, I find, and most other capital attorneys find to be the most traumatizing. And certainly they gotta be that way for, for juries, for jurors. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> to everyone, but Lindsay specifically, what good habits do you recommend for people that are entering a field like immigration or public defense for that matter to help them sustain their work for a full career? So this is a huge topic and I've written many pages on this, but I'll just say that uh, if you're entering this field or in your first few years, uh, talking about all of this is really kind of counterculture because I think law school really has a mentality that it's good, you know, to, to pull all nighters, to just be so committed to the work and to the cause, and maybe specifically in public interest arenas. You know, we want, we think first about our clients and not about ourselves. We don't want to talk about our emotional responses to this because again, you know, we are not the primary uh, victims or people, survivors of this trauma. Um, and so there's a kind of like burn it all down, win all the cases all the time mentality. And I think that what I would say is one person can change a culture. So if you can uh, listen to all those cliches about, you know, putting on your mask first as the plane is going down or you can't fill from an empty cup and actually normalize and prioritize your own well-being, you know, mental, physical, spiritual, all the dimensions of kind of self-care, that can actually lead to some kind of institutional changes and people around you also um, feeling like that's okay. One really effective thing, you know, um, Professor Raybill talked about a gratitude practice. Another one that I really like is kind of a, an accountability practice. So finding a couple of people who are in your field, right? Maybe they're in your public defense office or wherever you are and kind of like setting up a text chain and just sending each other messages every day. Like, what did you do for yourself, right? What did you do to carve out a moment of time um, for yourself and just kind of building on that and making it feel like it's okay to spend this time on ourselves and to push back on so much of what Eileen spoke about this morning in terms of the culture of just focusing on the work and not talking about our emotions. So there's a lot that has to change, but it does start with you and then pushing your institutions, pushing your law schools if you're a law student um, to, to think about these issues more. Great. Uh, there are so many great questions, but we only have a couple minutes left. Um, so know that if you sent in a question, um, I'm looking at all these questions. Um, this one just came in and I want to, I, I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I think it's worth asking. What advice would you give to a prospective law school student who has gone through sexual trauma? This was the reason that it took me 13 years after undergraduate, uh, undergraduate school to apply. Also, I was an undocumented person since the age of five. So I feel like that affected my value and worth to society. Um, any thoughts there for the group? Don't well, wanna dominate the discussion, but I'll just say um, I would be personally happy to connect with you and have connected with others. Um, sometimes the things that we do enjoy in our own lives are driving forces behind the work that we do, whether we realize it or not. Um, most of my work has focused on working with gender-based survivors of gender-based violence too. And I think that, again, it's so important to take care of yourself and to reach out and take advantage of some of the resources you have available to you as a law school, probably through your school and through your local bar association. Um, and yeah, there's a lot that I, first of all, we're so happy to have you in the legal profession. So thank you um, for taking this step, right? No matter how difficult your journey has been, you deserve to be here. We need you. And thank you for stepping up. And, and we really need your voice as an attorney um, in this profession. Great. From a psychological background, I want to emphasize that you should definitely take Lindsay up on that. Um, social support is often the number one resiliency tactic that we find in our research. So 
um, finding that social support and understanding that there will be triggers, especially if you're going into law school and, and being prepared to handle those. Great. Um, another quick question. Do you think the nature of the position affects judicial health in that judges are generally viewed by the public as these quote, all knowing, impartial and even keeled or non-emotional figures. So they may be more hesitant to show their emotional trauma. I know in the conversations that I had with judges and my students have had with judges, that is absolutely the case that they are not supposed to show anything, um, any sort of emotion. Um, and then last, one more quick one, Mark, I, this might be to you, but maybe to the whole group. Are you aware of any studies or research being done for other types of lawyers who deal with highly emotional cases, family law, domestic violence, et cetera? If so, is secondary trauma consistent across those professions? Lindsay may actually know more about that. I know there's articles written about it, studies, I'm not sure. Lindsay, do you know? Yeah, there have been some small studies done. I can't kind of cite them off the top of my head, but I do in my very long law review article that I'm about to submit next week. So um, I'll have that up on SSRN next week, but I'm happy to share a draft with anyone who wants to contact me. I have a, I'm on Twitter and my email address is easy to find on my school webpage. Great. I know we're over time by a couple of minutes, so many great questions, but I want to um, thank all of the panelists on panel number two. I want to tell you what an honor it has been to be able to speak with you all today and to moderate this panel. Um, thank you so much to Mark Rabel for um, organizing this amazing event, um, but uh, thank you to panel two, and now I'm going to pass it back off to Mark. <laughs>